Welcome to Deadhead Space. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Ghana, and all other major platforms, which now includes YouTube. That's right. You can now watch your favorite episodes, including this one, by searching Deadhead Space. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined always by my co-host, Brennan LaFaro. Say hi, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And today we're talking with legendary editor Don Diaria. Did I say that right? Because Hunter Shea says it one way, Brian Keane says it another. <laughs> I say it. I say it as Doria. ALV Doria from now on then. Say hi, Don. How, how, how did Hunter say it? Who was uh... Do you, do you remember Brennan? I, I... I do. The point goes to Keen. Uh, Hunter Hunter put the D in front of it, and uh, Brian Brian told us Daria. Yeah, he was right. Yeah. Although I've had members of my own family pronounce it differently, so <laughs> nobody knows. But I say Daria, and that's good enough for me. That's your name, so we'll go with what you say. Um, sp- speak- <laughs> speaking of uh, Hunter. He had a quick comment for you. Tell him the next round is on me and quickly followed by Brian Keene saying, tell him I've got the, the round after that. And uh, one other author you work with, Glenn Rolfe, said best editor in the business. Uh, I've, I've only pretty much heard people say that about you. And um, I have to say thank you real quick to Sarah Miniachi. I think that's how you say her name. I've yep. never heard Okay. So point goes to you, Brennan. You were right, buddy. Um, she set this up. She asked us who we want in the show. I already had Jonathan Jens and Hunter Shea. So I said, is Don an option? Um, I've, I've been in the review game for two years, and I'm, uh, your name comes up often. Um, and before we jump into who you've worked with, I'd like to know what, going all the way back, as far as you want to remember, what got you into horror initially? I honestly don't remember. It is, it is honestly, literally, as long as I can remember. Um, when I was a very little kid, I mean, three, um, there were, my sisters would say things like, oh, here, you like monsters, you'll like this. And they would you know, so, I mean, as long as I can remember, uh, I don't remember one thing that turned me on to it. I do remember watching Creature Features mm-hmm. all the time and Chiller Theater. Um, I grew up reading Famous Monsters. Um, as long as I can remember, I have all my original issues. Nice. Uh, but, you know, when I was growing up, it was in the middle of that horror boom. You know, I was a classic horror kid there were all the tv shows there were the movies you know the songs like monster mash so i was surrounded by it and i don't know what it was but you know my friends and i in grammar school we used to play monsters you know that was like our thing so i i honestly cannot remember a time when i was not into horror fantastic so i'm curious how you got into editing um what do you remember maybe was it a story that kind of made you say i'd like to get my feet wet in this area or what kind of what kind of got you into it man uh well uh when my first job in publishing was as a sales rep for uh, for r strauss and Giroux, hmm. more literary publisher i guess and you know, I, my territory was pretty much the Northeast and I had a great time. There were wonderful authors, uh, you know, Tom Wolf, Philip Roth. Um, but like everybody always says, you know, what I really want to do is direct. Uh, what I really wanted to do was edit. Hmm. So after a couple of years at Farrar Strauss, you know, I told people I want, I, what I really want to do is edit. You know, it was frustrating to have to treat the books as products Hmm. i wanted to be more involved in the creative side and decision making um so i took a huge pay cut basically (laughs) and started almost from scratch um got into editing um starting working for a book packager uh and then 
worked my way up from there. I started as an assistant editor and been there ever since. When uh, was that? So that was before same. No, Dorchester was before same. Hain. Sam Hain. Yeah. yeah. So how far back was that with the book packager? Uh, that would have been roughly 1990. Uh, I was at Farrar Strauss from like 86 to 89, thereabouts. I'm not quite certain. Uh, yeah, this was um, Cloverdale Press was a book packager. It's not even not even in business anymore. <laughs> Apparently had a great impact on it. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, from there I went to Bantam. So there were a few jobs before um, Dorchester Leisure um, where I was for about 15 years, I think. Was it, you started there in 95, I think it was? Uh, 96. Okay. Now, can you go through at least a few authors that you had to be awestruck by at least a few of them, man? I know you've worked with huge <laughs> names. Ketchum was, you, you, you were the one that edited Girl Next Door, right? When that came through Leisure? Uh, I mean, I, it was a reprint by that point. Right, I didn't right. Edit uh, I didn't do the original book. Right. Yeah. And, you know, Off Season, Girl Next Door, uh, all of the, all of Jack's books um, at Leisure were done through me. Uh, all the, like, I basically, the, the horror line started with me. So any of the Dorchester or Leisure horror I edited uh, or acquired, including the layman's, etc. That's pretty odd. I got a stack right next to me. You got a Mary San Giovanni's debut, Keen, Ketchum, Layman. Um, there's there are so many amazing books here. And I didn't know about any of these until I started reviewing and getting my feet wet and in, into it because I, uh, throughout high school, unlike a lot of my peers, I wasn't into reading back then, uh, which would have been the early aughts for me. And mm -hmm. that's I know that's when Keen and uh, the others really started taking off. Um, but before before we really dive into that, the '90s for for uh, Dorchester, would would you say there was anything vastly different how authors were maybe treated or how they were handled by both reader and the behind the scenes to compare to say the early aughts or now? Uh, well, when, when I started at uh, Dorchester and when we started the, the Leisure Horror line, uh, at that point, uh, horror was seen, uh, no pun intended, as pretty much dead. <laughs> uh, it was, there was the big horror boom in the 80s, mm -hmm. and then that cratered. So nobody was really doing horror, uh, which is the main reason we started the leisure horror line because there was hardly any competition really except for people like Stephen King and Peter Straub. Um, so there was a hunger in the marketplace with the accounts and the chains and bookstores for horror. Nobody was doing horror. And when I started agents uh, when they would submit books to me, they tended to not call their books horror because they'd been hearing for years that horror was dead. And nobody wanted to buy horror. So I would get these submissions, you know, from an agent saying it's a supernatural, psychological, suspense, thriller, you know, they would do anything but call it horror. And the toughest thing that I had when we were starting out was there were plenty of authors who were writing horror, mm. but very few agents were representing it because it, they didn't see it as a money-making gambit. So we were open to unagented manuscripts because if I had to rely on agents, I wouldn't have seen anything. Hardly any agents were representing horror in those days. That has changed, uh, definitely. Um, now, people, and I'm not saying it was because of leisure, but the times have changed and now horror is once again seen as like profitable and worthwhile. So there are more agents who do it, you know, and I see a lot more agented things. 
I um we talked about this the second episode of season two was uh with Alan Baxter. We talked about this with him. We had Brian Keen on for episode one and we we ran through a few things of uh Brian Keen's end of the road and I learned a lot about the behind the scenes, such as uh you know, I, I got JF Gonzalez's Survivor uh Leisure. Good and, book. Yeah, uh, I haven't read it yet. It's on my I have. <laughs> yeah. But I bring it up because it says here, if you purchase this book without a cover, you should be aware of that this book is stolen property and blah, blah, blah. So mm-hmm. I never got that. I didn't understand it. Didn't think to ask anyone. Uh, it was just mm-hmm. one of those things you see and it kind of leaves your, you know, goes in yeah. one ear out the other. And Brian goes through that. And for all those that are unaware, it's, you know what? How about you? You know, would you mind explaining that? Because actually maybe sure. you can tell us some stuff. I don't know. <laughs> which is probably <Yeah>. everything <laughs> well there are basically in terms of paperbacks and this gets kind of you know publishing biz but in 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 the business there are two kinds of paperbacks there's mass market and trade um in general trade paperbacks tend to be the larger formatted and mass market tend to be what we call rack size mm-hmm. Um, the important thing about them though is the way returns are handled in uh, publishing when a publisher publishes a book sales reps you know go out and they sell the books to the accounts and the accounts buy whatever they feel like they're going to sell anything that they don't sell is returnable right they will get full refund Mm -hmm. And the difference between mass market and trade is to return a trade paperback or a hardcover, you send the full copy back, the whole book, you ship it, and that's how you're credited. For mass market, because it tends to be cheaper paper um, and they're produced in such high quantities, they don't have full copy returns, they accept covers. So what the account does, it's literally not worth shipping the whole book back. You pay more in shipping than it would be worth. So you strip the cover, as it's called. Uh, You just rip off the cover and you would send the cover back, which leaves the bookstore with a stripped book, a book with no front cover. And people don't do it that much anymore, but it used to be in the 80s, 90s. Uh, you would go to some stores and you would see books just with no covers, usually on sale for like a quarter. You know, it would be a little extra money the stores, but the store told the publisher that supposedly they're going to destroy the book. They weren't supposed to sell it again. So that's why there's that little thing. If you bought this book without a cover, Basically, the, the bookstore was naughty and sold it when they shouldn't have. They told us they were going to destroy it. So please don't encourage that. Brandon, what are your thoughts, man? <laughs> that's, that's 1990s piracy. That's, um, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's downloading the Kindle version for free on some you know, website with a, a name a mile long. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, I mean, they were, you know, they were getting two bites of the apple they were getting paid the you know refunded the full amount and they sold you know the stripped copy for probably a quarter yeah you know and 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 even if the bookstore didn't see a colossal profit off that it just throwing all those out you know as a fan of books is just like that hurts my heart i can't even (laughs) yeah i'm glad somebody got to read i'm glad those books went to a good home (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the the problem, you know, we didn't really, publishers don't begrudge the bookstores the, you know, 25 cents. The issue is that a a reader would pay 25 cents to get this strip book and then wouldn't buy the actual full copy. So we were out that sale. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the 25 cents that the the bookstore got. It was the, you know, 4.99, 5.99 that we weren't getting. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And the public, the authors weren't getting royalties on it. That's, That's a good up. point. Yes. Yeah. 
Brennan, um, well, I, you had some really interesting questions leading into, I know you had some for uh, Leisure, but I know you had some other good ones for later publishers. So why don't you lead the way for, for that section? So, I mean, we, we have you on here, Don, and you know a lot of people are going to know you as a horror publisher or editor. Um, but you've done work with uh, in in lots of genres in thriller with with western um, and yep. you know just to name a couple. So what's mm -hmm. your experience like uh, editing in different genres? You know how how does switching gears work for you? Luckily, the genres I've worked in have been genres that I enjoy. Um, when I first started, you know. I, uh, at that packager as an assistant editor, I had less control over the books that I was acquiring. You know, um, I was working for other editors. So, you know, I was doing some nonfiction. I was doing what they used to call men's action adventure in those days. What's that? Um, that would have been roughly the equivalent of, you know, Rambo. Oh, okay. <laughs> You know, it was a lot of machine guns and rocket launchers and trucks and things like that, which, you know, I, I have no problem with. It's just not a genre that I tend to particularly enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, as I moved on, you know, different jobs and got promoted, um, I began to have much more say of the books that I was acquiring and editing. And... I could do books that I actually liked. I've always liked Westerns and thrillers and sci-fi, you know, for some reason, I, you know, who knows, who knows why anybody likes any genre, you know. <laughs> um, they've always been things I've enjoyed and they're really, the basics of editing are the same, no matter the genre. You know, you wanna have likable characters, you wanna have a plot that's gonna hold people's interest uh, you want the pacing to be good. You want the, the style to be smooth. Um, different genres have different tropes, if you want to call them that. You know, different uh, aspects of the book that work in different genres. You know, in Westerns, it really helps if you've got, you know, a noble, lone character going out there, you know. So those will change, but the basic requirements of any novel uh, are are really kind of the same. So, I mean, you, 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 it sounds to me like you don't really have to do much, forgive me if I'm oversimplifying that, to change gears between I'm going to edit a, a, a horror novel right now and then I'm going to move on to a sci-fi novel and then after that I'm going to edit um, a Western novel. Um, what's, let, let's say a 200 to 300 page novel, what's your average time and process like? To do uh, a line edit or to do what? Well, ta take um, us through, there different... yeah, yep. take, a, take us through the different things that, you know, you would do for various authors and stories. Okay. Um, well, first going back to your first point, uh, you know, at uh, Flame Tree, you know, uh, we do horror, but we also do uh, crime thrillers, sci-fi, and fantasy. So I do all of those genres. So I will do, you know, uh, you know, I could do two of those in a month, uh, or I could go from one genre in one month to another genre in the next month. So, you know, I do constantly change gears from horror, sci-fi, fantasy, crime, back again, two horror, one fantasy, you know, whatever. Um, the process is different for if it's someone, uh, a submitted manuscript from someone I haven't worked with before. Uh, you know, if I'm reading a submission, first I read it just to see if it's good, to see how the writing is, to see if the plot holds up, um, all those different factors. If it is good, then you know I will make an offer and hopefully buy the book. Now it's possible when I read the book, there was something in there that I thought needed to be fixed. Um, you know, it's great, but this character doesn't 
do anything or this plot point doesn't make any sense. Why would you have this? You know, in that case, I would ask for revisions and I would explain to the author what I, the problem that I had and hopefully the author would agree, you know, um, if it was a massive problem, like something that would make the book unpublishable if it weren't revised uh, and the author said, no, I really, I wanna keep it this way. Then I would say, well, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, good luck. Some other house will probably love it. Um, but if the author is willing to revise, revise it, that would be the first stage. Uh, then I would go through and do what's generally called a line edit, which is style, uh, characters, um, you know, basically the, I don't know, the sort of meat and potatoes of the thing. I wanna make sure it's as good as it can be. Uh, if there's any characters, dialogue, all that kind of stuff, that's what I do. Uh, I do the line edit. Uh, after that, it would go to a copy editor. Uh, the copy editor tends to do more things like spelling, punctuation, uh, continuity. You know, uh, if a character is dead in chapter four, he shouldn't still be alive in chapter six. Uh, <laughs> although in horror, that, that can happen. Uh, then after that, the, all the edits go back to the author to make sure the author is happy with it. Uh, if there are any questions I have or the copy editor has, the author would answer those questions and address them in the manuscript. And then when the manuscript is as good as the author can do it and I can do it and copy editor and everybody, then it goes off to production and they typeset it and print it. For an author that I've worked with before, uh, it's someone that I trust and I know they can write a book. Uh, I will often uh, buy a book on just a proposal uh, synopsis. Uh, you know, so then it would be give me a plot that makes sense that I think will be exciting that readers will want to read and we'll go to contract at that point. And then you, when you finish the manuscript, send it in and we'll begin the other process of the line edits. Hmm. That's that's really interesting. I didn't even think of it from that perspective of if, you know, with an author that you've worked with previously and not just at Flame Tree. I mean, some of the people uh, like a Hunter Shea or a Jonathan Jans, you know, saw their stuff at Samhain as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know exactly what you're going to get from that person. Um, you, you, yeah, you, you, you know that you're going to get a good put together book and you, you know, you, you know how much work is going to go into the final product and how it's going to do once you get it out. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. And it's not always foolproof, you know, an author, even someone that I've worked with many times could in theory drop a ball somewhere, you know, and I could still send the manuscript back for revisions, but generally that doesn't happen. If it's someone I've worked with before, I know their style. I know, that they know what they're doing, you know, and they have as much of a command of their books as I do. So, you know, I just, I rely on them to do the job well. Hmm. Makes perfect sense. Uh, can you take us back to Flame Tree? Now, Hunter Shea told us that it was him and Ramsey Campbell that you took on and they were kind of like the previous publisher. It was those two at first as well. So, mm -hmm. What is it about Ramsey and what is it about Hunter Shea where you're like, those are my two starting authors? Um, I mean, I love both of them. They weren't the only two, but, <laughs> you know, uh, John Everson, um, Jonathan Jans, um, you know, uh, were from Sam Hain, hmm. uh, Catherine Cavendish, you know, so there were a number of authors. Okay. Uh, but, um, just going to Hunter and Ramsey, they're very different. They're very, as you probably know, uh, very different styles. Ramsey's much more subtle, slow build. Um, Hunter's a little more in your face. He's not like extreme, but he's 
more visceral. And I like both of those. You know, I mean, I, I like all different kinds of horror. Um, you know, there are gothic horror, supernatural horror, non-supernatural horror. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to cast a very wide net. But both of those, uh, Hunter and Ramsey, are incredibly talented authors. Uh, I mean, I think yeah. all the authors I work with are incredibly talented or I wouldn't be work working with them. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they're very dependable and just excellent writers and I enjoy everything they do. Now, this is one of the books I'm reading right now. Oh, yes. Brennan's, Brennan's probably finished it for those, uh, for audio listeners. I, I am close. I am close. I'm about like 80% through. <laughs> Man, he blows me away with every book we read. Uh, audio listeners, I just held up Ramsey Campbell's The Search and Dead. It's a reissued version. Um, what, I'm curious, why did you go with that trilogy? Uh, it's it's an amazing trilogy and you know i'm not the first one to say it but uh, reviewers have said it is ramsey ramsey at the height of his powers hmm. um it's lovecraftian in a way kind of you know which is going back to ramsey's initial strength i mean when he started he started out as sort of lovecraftian um it had never been widely available in the u.s uh, which is important, you know, mm -hmm. we want to be able to sell books. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so it was our chance to introduce a much wider audience to excellent work by one of the best authors in the biz. Fair, a very fair statement. Um, mm. yeah, yeah, and I didn't know this until I read it on the back. But it says that uh, Ramsey Campbell has been given more awards than any other writer in the field today. Um, I knew, obviously, he had awards. I didn't know that, like, he <laughs> he outweighed everyone else, which isn't a shock. He's been doing it since, what, the 70s? Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he does. I mean, that's not a lie. He has more awards than anyone else uh, writing. It's amazing. I mean, you know, and lifetime achievement awards grand master awards you know he's hands down one of the most one of the most polite one of the I can't talk one of the politest people i've ever talked to he's very kind to everyone yeah even me <laughs> <laughs> brennan um i lost my train of thought man Lots so you know in. what I, I would put in on that book and I won't go overboard because we're going to have uh, Ramsey on in about a week and we'll want to talk about the book more then. But for anybody looking to pre-order it, what kind of draws me in about the first book, The Searching Dead, um, is coming coming of age is nothing new you know but it is really big in horror right now. And a lot of the coming of age stuff that's coming out now, uh, is very heart on the sleeve. Um, and the way Ramsey writes just, you know, from page one builds this atmosphere of dread. And he still manages to write a coming of age where you get attached to these uh, younger characters. But it's, I don't even know how to put it into words exactly further than I already have. It's, it's, it's very interesting, but it works. Um, and I think that people who haven't had the chance to check this trilogy out before are going to enjoy it. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to kind of jump gears here to, uh, I believe you had an interview with Janine uh, Piper, right? Piper's your last name, Brennan? Uh, Pipe, no R. Oh, I'm thinking of Haley Piper. Hmm. Mm. My bad. <laughs> um, and in it, she... I believe she was the one that asked you a question that led to you talking about how basically you're, you're looking to um, look for other voices, I guess would be the best way. Mm -hmm. And one of the names that came up is actually a friend of the show, v Violet Castro. Oh, um, yes. Very excited for the queen of cicadas as well as yep. her other book. Uh, was it the um, goddess of filth novella? Mm -hmm. oh, that's pretty neat, but I'd like to hear your take on, really you don't seem like the kind of guy that just started thinking like that i mean you seem like you just you're after as many voices not just <laughs> white dudes uh oh. you, you 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 come off to me like you're, you've always been like that um 
So I'm just curious how maybe your perception is on it, how the majority is starting to catch up with you. And, it, and correct me if I put any words in your mouth, please. No, no, no. I mean, I think it's about time. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I certainly have no problem with it. I mean, the, uh, you know, a, a tagline for uh, Flame Tree Press is fiction without frontiers. And, you know, we mean it in terms of genres. We have books that blur the lines in different genres, but also we actively want, it's very important to us to get different cultures and different voices and different perspectives. Um, and, and that is something that, you know, I've been able to do luckily, I mean, really in a way going back to when I was at uh, Bantam uh, Doubleday, uh, I, when I was doing Westerns, uh, made a very strong point to get a lot of Westerns from the Native American perspectives. Mm you know, not just the cowboys. So, you know, we had books from the Cherokee perspective and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and at Dorchester, again, tried to get a, a broad spectrum of people and I'm still trying uh, and I'm, I'm sure I can still do better, but it's something that I'm actively looking for. You know, uh, agents ask me all the time, what are you looking for? And I tell them, you know, I'm looking for different perspectives. I'm looking to, to broaden things a bit. That's, that's great. Um, what, without giving away the book, obviously, what, what, what is it about V's book, uh, Queen of Cicadas, that struck you? Uh, it was a very powerful book. Um, I don't know if you've read it. But, no, no, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's even been printed yet. Uh, not by us, no. But I mean, I don't know if maybe she gave you a manuscript or something. No, nope. um, no, it's a very justifiably angry point of view. Hmm. Um, the, the main character is a migrant worker in the, the 1950s who's murdered you know, um, and just, yeah, obviously that character is angry at, at being <laughs> murdered, you know? but you agree with it, you know, and, and of course you would. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's very powerful, it's very strong. It has a very distinct point of view. Um, and it just caught me up and it was innovative. It was different. Um, which is also something that I always look for in a book. I don't really want the same thing over and over again. Um, so, yeah, I'm very excited about this. And after Queen of the Cicadas, we'll be doing uh, Mestizo Blood, a collection of her short stories. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, she's a, a great voice with a great point of view. And a great person, too, which is yeah. a killer combination. Um mm. On that note, because we've talked about agents. Um... Mm -hmm. So real quick, before we move on from V, the, you know, the only thing I would add to that is just not having read it, but having read, uh, I think, pretty much everything else she's put out. I, I'm imagining that is just, you know, in that regard to other voices, that that book is probably something that only she could have written. Um, and that's that's that beauty of, of making sure that uh, you do go out and look and that's where you're going to get the different stories. Obviously people who have lived those different perspectives and one of my favorite moments, and this is uh, Pat, what, what, what episode are we on right now? Well, you're, you're the numbers guy. Oh yeah. Well, we've recorded, this is 67th. So this is okay. Be like 60. Let's go with 67. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite episodes in, in the first 66 is, uh, Violet Castro talking about what it meant to know that uh, her book with written from her perspective is coming out through uh, a, a, a big publisher that's going to put that book uh, in the hands of other people who might think I'm never going to get my story told. Mm -hmm. um, really, really cool. And I can't wait to get my hands on that thing. Pat, I'm uh sorry. I interrupted you, man. 
<laughs> no, that's that's fine. That's a really good. I'm glad you put uh, made that comment. I, I told V this, but I mean, I keep saying it, and it. I feel bad because there's so many other great authors, but V, you know what? You got everyone's got their favorites. V Castro is one of mine. Uh, another one is Sam, Samantha Koyesnik. Came out with True Crime last year. I don't know if you read that, but excellent novella. Um, so I was going to ask for. We've talked about agents. We've talked about um what you look for but um i don't think we've covered this yet just because you have an interesting point of view for this uh how would and it doesn't even have to be with flame tree um but what would you suggest to a newer agent less writer to uh submit to flame tree or wh whomever uh well a few things one do some homework. Um, Flame Tree does accept unagented manuscripts. Um, most of the big five, I think pretty much all of the big five, your Hachettes and Penguin, etc., cetera, uh, have a policy where they do not accept unagented manuscripts. So if you submit it, they will just bounce it right back to you. Hmm. So every publisher, you know, you should do some research, find publishers that actually publish books like the one you've written. Um, I get submissions from people like, you know, I, I wouldn't even say genres, you know, that we've never published. And people send submissions to me. It's like, did you see, we never published a single book like this. Why do you think we were going to do it? <laughs> um, but look at the house look at their guidelines. Every publisher lists guidelines. If you go to their website and they are very explicit, you know, how they want the manuscript to be. Do they want the complete manuscript? Do they want a partial? Do they want it in what program? Mm -hmm. um, do they want a synopsis? And give the house what they want, basically. Um, you know, I get a lot of submissions from people who've if they have looked at our guidelines, they chose to disregard them. Um, <laughs> and I have to write back and say, if you want to submit your manuscript, please, you know, here's the link to our guidelines, you know, send me the complete, send it as a word docs, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. So in that sense, sort of be professional, mm -hmm. um, give the publishers, give the editors what they want, what they're looking for, make it as easy as possible. Because, like, I get, I mean, huge amount of submissions. And it's, if you give me something that is not what I'm looking for, it's very easy to send that back. You know, if you want me to keep reading it, give me what I've asked for in the guidelines. Yeah, that that's perfect advice. Um, you said one thing that stuck out to me I've never heard before. You said program. Now, are we talking about like Microsoft Word or another uh, word processor? Yeah, for us, uh, we uh, ask that all submissions be uh, Word docs. Oh, when okay. It could, be a, it could be Word doc. It could be a docx. Oh, oh, okay. I got you. You know, but don't send a PDF. Um, you know, don't send there, are, you know, simply because it, it's harder to read, mm -hmm. you know, don't make it hard for me to read it. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, and at this point, everybody has word the, yeah. for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I would ask general, um, manuscript format. So double spacing, you know, one inch one inch margins. Um, don't send it like, you know, four point type, you know, just be in a way, be considerate. Mm -hmm. And you know what, before I forget, Simon and Schuster, I wasn't aware that you guys were, you're, is that an imprint of Simon and Schuster? I just, uh, maybe I'm oblivious, but I just realized uh, mm -hmm. the end of last year that you're through them. How, yeah. how did, how did that uh, come about? It's, again, this may be getting into more sort of publishing term than you want. Uh, we are not an imprint, we're independently owned. We are okay. an independent company. 
uh, we are a distribution line of Simon & Schuster. Okay. So I, as an editor, am not employed by Simon & Schuster. I'm employed by Flame Tree. Mm -hmm. The sales force that we use, uh, the sales reps are Simon & Schuster sales reps. So that's basically, you know, they do our warehousing, shipping, fulfilling, and sales, but editorially, we're an independent company. Oh, interesting. So ultimately, it will lead to more books into larger chains or supermarkets or what have you. Yeah, that's the idea, you know, that every, uh, every bookstore, every chain, every wholesaler, every library sees a Simon & Schuster rep mm -hmm. um, because they're one of the big five. Um, so, and the same rep who's selling other Simon and Schuster books would now be selling us as well. So it gives us uh, increased visibility and distribution uh, in all the accounts and libraries. Hmm, neat, uh, Brenny. Why don't you go ahead, bud? Yeah, I. You know, I. I'm. I'm still stuck on the submissions guidelines thing. I will never understand uh, from a writer's perspective how people can so blatantly ignore them. I mean, it's, this is your introduction. It's a, if, if you, if we met in person, you said, hi, my name is Don. And I said, hey, Bill, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> we've gotten off on a bad foot and whatever business we have to transact is probably not gonna work in my favor. If I, if, if a publisher, if my goal is to get my work published with you, whether it's Flame Tree or any other publisher out there, my best shot is to send it in a way that works for you, that fits what you're looking to do um, and make it easy for you to read. Because, you know, to my mind, if I am submitting, you know, several thousand words longer than you want, uh, I've already got a mark against me before you even open the document. If I submit you like, you know, uh, uh, and a, a, a spreadsheet that has an entire story rather than a word document. Again, I've already got, you know, a mark in the black against me. Um, no question here. I just, I, I, I don't understand how we're still talking about look at the submission guidelines before you send a, um, a, a query email to somebody that you want to take your work, publish it, make it better and then pay you for it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I've gotten, you know, every, Every editor uh, has stories about submissions and a lot of them are the same kind of stories. Um, a common one that I've seen, and I, you know, I don't see that that often, but certainly often enough, is someone was, I've written this great book. Here are three sample chapters, chapter six, chapter 14, and chapter 28. <laughs> like basically saying those first five chapters they're, they're nothing, you know, uh, it gets good, you know, chapter six. So, you know, that isn't going to persuade anybody. Uh, and a, a lot of people, and I certainly understand this, if they're submitting, they will basically use like a form email. But at least take the time to note if you say in your form email, I think you know, X publishing house is great. Make sure that Flame Tree is the X. <laughs> I've gotten, you know, I think Tor is the place I really want to be. You know? <laughs> Good luck with them, you know. <laughs> Let me dig up their email for you. <laughs> yeah, you know, read through, you know, if you can't proof your email, you know, if you can't handle, <laughs> Proofing an email uh, doesn't hold much hope for your manuscript. It's true. Yeah. Now, you mentioned earlier, uh, we, we kind of talked about how when you receive a submission or um, even just a, a synopsis from a familiar author, you know what you're getting. Now, when you get something from uh, an author you've never worked with before, uh, let's, let's say specific to horror, what do you look for in a horror book? Um, besides the things we've already talked about, a, a story that's a little bit different than what's come before. What else do you look for in a horror book that you're going to publish with, with Flame Tree? 
probably assuming the plot is good and not like something I've just published or something like that. Um, probably the main thing would be the voice. If you have a, uh, you know, an original voice, but a compelling voice. And a lot of times you can tell that relatively quickly. Um, if something comes across as stilted and off putting as opposed to something that really grabs you and pulls you into the book. Um, that's the first thing I would look for because that's probably the first thing you can tell. You know, you can tell the voice on the first page or two. Mm -hmm. Things like pacing and plot and characters, you have to read more, but voice you can get pretty quickly. One thing I struggle with uh, or did for a while Again, better over the years, but passive voice that, mm. especially in the first draft, that sneaks up in your real, real, at least on me, it sneaks up on me all the time. I hate it when, like, <laughs> Brennan's one of my betas. When he, re, you know, reads and sends it back, I go, Oh, guess I haven't learned it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Brennan, you got to follow up with that. I, it looked like I cut you off. Not, not on that necessarily, but one thing I want to make sure we we ask you, for anybody who's listening that would like to try and get into publishing in, you know, not, not as an author, but more as an editor or behind the scenes, somebody who's trying to break into the business at the ground level, what advice do you have for people like that? Uh it's changed over the years. It's different now than when I started. Um, when I started, it was like papyrus scrolls and cuneiform tablets. <laughs> um, generally, I would uh, recommend, if possible, uh, try for an internship. Um, you know, get your foot in the door. Find uh, a house that publishes something that you like. Mm -hmm. um, if, if at all possible, you know, because you want to work on books that you're going to enjoy. And if it's something that you enjoy, you're going to be more knowledgeable about it. So if you go to a publisher that specializes in pottery books and you have no idea you know, what pottery even is, you're not going to be a particularly great editor in a pottery book. See what I mean? So you know, uh, it, it's kind of a cliche, but, you know, like they say for authors, write what you know, for editors, like edit what you know, edit what you like, if mm -hmm. you can, you know, you, you won't have that option right off the bat, but just keep trying to hone in on the things that you do like. Um, you know, for me, I kept trying to move toward horror and thrillers and things like that. Um, and, you know, be prepared to, if it's an internship or if you're starting out in editorial as an editorial assistant, you know, there will be, you know, sort of, you know, lower level things to do, you know. Um, it won't be particularly glamorous, but um, it's sort of like paying your dues, everyone does. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing, try to get your foot in the door. Don't necessarily, I mean, it'd be great, you know, if you work at penguin or something that would be terrific but a lot of people like i did start at a smaller house um you know you're more likely to get a job there and work your way up to bigger houses work your way up to the genres that you like you know just sort of keep an eye on what your goals are and just try to keep moving toward them um, forgive me if you already answered this, but horror, is that is that your like go-to genre or is sci-fi, Western, or any of the other ones we've talked about? Do, do any of them stick out above the other? I would say, yeah, horror would be for me. Um, yeah. I, I certainly enjoy um, sci-fi, fantasy, thrillers, you know. Um, but yeah, if push came to shove, I would say horror. That was my initial love that was you know the first thing that really got me excited hmm. uh, so yeah okay if i had to choose i would probably pick that one <laughs> same now yeah. february women in horror month it's coming up so through flame tree press which uh women would you suggest um 
old or newer books that people look into? Ooh, of ones that we have published in general or? Well, you could go with really any publisher now. So I just figured since you were playing free that that might be a yeah. good way. Well, I'll, I'll plug uh, uh, my books. Sure. Uh, obviously, you know, just thinking in terms of horror, uh, Catherine Cavendish, uh, who tends to be uh, more sort of gothic horror. Mm -hmm. uh, P.D. Kasich. Uh, Trish Kasich. Uh, she's a Stoker Award winning author. Um, the books that, uh, that she has done for us uh, have kind of veered a little more almost into like Twilight Zone fantasy kind of stuff. Mm. Again, it's one of those things that, you know, we blur the line uh, between genres. Um, Holly Moncrief, uh, she would be an excellent choice. Um, Ooh, I'm trying to think of who is on our list. Who am I put one in your mouth? Uh, uh, Faye Snowden. Oh, yes. I, I have on my shelf, and I, I hear great things, but I haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't think of her as a horror author. I guess she would be more of a thriller author. Yep. Um, but yeah, definitely her. I mean, let's just see. Who is on my list? Who would we have here? Because again, it could be authors that I don't think of as primarily horror. Um, dum -da -dum -da -dum. Oh, well, um, I mean, she's part of a writing team, but um, Melissa Prusi, uh, Hopstaken and Prusi, uh, it's a husband and wife ride, writing team. Uh, mm -hmm. Their books, uh, Stoker's Wild and Stoker's Wild West are incredibly fun. Um, using the historical characters of Bram Stoker and Oscar Wilde. So half of them is a woman, if that counts. <laughs> Brennan, why don't you lead with uh, one of your last questions? It's a pretty good one. Um, so yeah, sure. Let's, um, let's take a minute and tell anybody who's listening what some of the titles um, that they can expect to see from Flame Tree in 2021 are. Ooh, let's see. Uh, Catherine Cavendish. Um, should I stick with horror or all genres? What do you? What would you like? We 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 cycle into crime uh, sometimes, so we might have some people who are looking for crime and thrillers as well. Whatever you'd like to throw out there. All right. Uh, for Ramsey, uh, The Searching Dead, as you already indicated, uh, we have a new book from Tim Wagner, uh, Your Turn to Suffer. That'll be coming in March. Um, Queen of the Cicadas in June, uh, an original thriller from Ramsey uh, called Somebody's Voice hmm. that will also be coming in June. Um, new book by Glenn Rolfe. You said you'd interviewed him. Uh, his uh, book is August's Eyes, and that will be coming out, of course, in August. Yeah, we got, we got him for August for the first time. We're really looking <laughs> for, forward to that. And then in October, uh, we have because of obvious connections. Uh, we have Hunter Shea, his new book, Faithless. Uh, Holly Moncrief, J.H. Moncrief, officially, uh, her new novel, The Restoration, and the next book in Ramsey's trilogy, Born to the Dark. Ooh, that Born to the Dark comes out this year? Uh, yes, October. Excellent. Oh, okay. Uh, now, one of the last questions we ask guests is what are you currently reading? Is there anything, do you have moments where you can read books <laughs> beyond the ones you're working on? Uh, not a heck of a lot. But <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times uh, because, uh, you know, obviously what I read for work tends to be fiction. Um, sometimes I will read uh, nonfiction uh, just to, as a, sorbet to cleanse my palate you know um this as a change of pace so like a biography or something like that hmm. so. have you ever read anything by uh, walter isaacson no he 2011 he came out with uh, steve jobs uh first one was one of the first ones was benjamin franklin uh einstein they did a mini series on the history channel um and then the latest one was Leonardo da Vinci. Oh. So a lot of, lot of interesting stuff. Um, 
Brendan, what about you, man? What do you got on your plate? Uh, I am about to jump into Hearts Strange and Dreadful by Tim McGregor. I'm probably going to start that a little later tonight. I've been looking forward to that one. Um, and I am, of course, about to wrap up uh, The Searching Dead, probably finish that tomorrow or Monday. And I am very, I'm, I'm looking forward. I didn't know the next one was coming out in October. I thought that it was going to be one a year. So I am really excited because that next one just jumped up a couple months in my mind. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we want to keep, you know, Ramsey coming at a fairly good pace. Um, and especially with this trilogy, because they were uh, already written, just not widely available. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, and in between the trilogy, we have original books by Ramsey, like somebody's voice, you know, like I said. That's um, awesome. Is there anything you guys would like to see Flame Tree do? For <laughs> authors? <laughs> yeah, or any type of thing. Uh, no, I got. I mean, it's it's going to be a cop out answer, but I mean, I, I I love what Flame Tree is doing. I I love my uh, typically my yearly Jonathan Jans book, my yearly Hunter Shea book, uh, mm -hmm. my by, my my semi yearly Ramsey Campbell Campbell book. Um, I've got In Darkness Shadows Breathe. I hope I didn't mess up that title. Nope, Ready to it. go pretty quick here. Um, it, Catherine Cavendish is definitely another one who nails that atmosphere, uh, kind of like Ramsey Campbell does a little bit in a different way, but mm -hmm. her books have a feel to them um, that you, you don't get elsewhere. So I'm afraid, yeah, yeah my answer is a cop out. Let's throw it to you, Pat. Go ahead. Save us. Yeah, I got, I actually got one. Um, oh, there you go. It'd be interesting if it, it totally fits with what you guys do. It'd be interesting if there were, Authors from the 80s and 90s and heck, even the 70s, because uh, I got at least one in my head, um, that's still right today, that mm -hmm. it could be reissued copies that just aren't around that much. The first person I got in my mind, he's a good, he's actually a good friend of mine and Brennan's now, is uh, Ronald Kelly. He's, mm. he's starting to get recognition again, but I, I'm blown away at uh, as to how many people don't know him. And I can't act like I didn't know him a year ago because I didn't. So got an uh, author like Ron, Ronald Kelly, uh, an author like Lisa Tuttle, um, and then Sydney Williams, I think, is the one through uh, Dell. I think it was Dell. Just authors like that, ones that still write, but they got what you're doing. You, you reminded me that Ramsey Campbell has got his reissued copies that are great, but they just aren't either sold throughout enough, uh, wi widely enough, or just for whatever reason, you know, get lost into the pile. Actually, mm -hmm. Brian King said something. He said, there's just so much now that even the older authors are trying to get a voice out there. That That's in a nutshell, if they were the old voices that are still new, to put it the best way, that, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd be uh, especially interested, you know, for authors who are still writing for new material by them. Um, a reissue if it's something that hasn't been available at least for a long time, possibly, but I'd be more interested in something new and current and that something that hasn't been available before. Yeah, well, I can't speak for the others, but I know Ron Ronald Kelly's put out three collections last year and they're all awesome. They're killer. And he's got a, he's working on, I know, at least one novel. That I, pro I don't know if I'm allowed to announce. He kind of hinted at it. And then he's got at least one Irish Gothic is the name of it, uh, collection coming out. So that'd be my suggestion. Ronald, More Ronald Kelly, man. He's <laughs> someone that I've fallen in love with as a fan. Um, wow, that's a great question. No one's asked us that before. That's, no. <laughs> that's a really good question. As you can tell, we were unprepared for it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, never man. know when these little spot quizzes could come up, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad we actually read. He started books. interviewing us. We got Jans. <laughs> oh no! Hey, you're spending too much time with that Jans fella. <laughs> now we're hitting the one hour mark, uh, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time, sir. Is there anything that you'd like more people to know, or is there anything that we maybe haven't touched that you would like to talk about? Ooh, well, uh, obviously, I would like. I would like people to think of 
flame tree as, and this is another like company slogan. It's like award-winning authors and original voices. Mm -hmm. And I would love it if readers could come to rely on flame tree for both of those things. You know, we do have award winners. We have Ramsey Campbell, you know, we yeah. have, we have Stoker winners. We have all sorts of, you know, uh, but I always have new authors at the same time mm. you know, because the only way to keep the genre going is to have new authors, you know, to introduce people to Jonathan Jans or, you know, Brian Keene, you know, whoever it may, you know, people that I've published early books from over the years. And if you don't keep the new people coming and new voices, then things tend to get stale. So I hope readers will come to see uh, Flame Tree as both of those things. I think it's safe to say, I know Brandon and I do, and I'm, I feel like that's kind of, that is how people view from the cer my circle of uh, friends that read Flame Tree. I got one more name actually, Laurel Hightower. Uh, she's a hell of a writer. I don't know if you've read, uh, she came up with a novella last year called Crossroads. It's, it's powerful stuff, man. It's mm -hmm. ghost story, mother. Uh, it, oh, have you heard of it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, people have to, uh, approach me. They have to send things in. I got so. you. Message <laughs> received. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, I hope people will also not only look for us, you know, books to buy, but I hope people will see us as a house to publish their books. Um, you know, I think we treat our authors with respect and, you know, friendship and we get yeah. the books out there, you know, and I think, uh, I, I hope that authors will see us as a, a place to have their books published. Well, for any reviewers listening, because I can't speak as a published author there, but as a reviewer, Everyone I've dealt with has been nothing but communicative, respond pretty, pretty damn quickly. You're, you guys are, are a fairly big name, man. And uh, it's actually, it's pretty refreshing. Um, not to knock any other publishers I've talked to, but it's just nice. It's nice to know that you guys got your Thank foot you. in kind of both camps. Man, yeah, we're a decent bunch of guys. Yeah. <laughs> Friend, you got any final words, sir? No, I think I think we got it. Uh, Don, is there any place that uh, people can follow you on social media? Uh, I'm on uh, me personally. Yep. Uh, I'm on or Twitter. Flame Tree. Or Flame Tree, yeah. Flame Tree is everywhere. Flame Tree. <laughs> you know, I tend to be a bit more of a recluse, but mm -hmm. uh, so I'm on Twitter, but Flame Tree itself is on Facebook and Twitter and like any any social media that you can imagine uh, fantastic um thank you so much we appreciate this and uh i don't know what else to say it's a it's a real honor to have you on uh, i i didn't even bring up the fact that i live in jersey as well so there you go <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to knock hunter earlier when he said he's in your face and i'd say well that's a typical jersey guy but i might seem like a dick <laughs> If you don't know that, I live here too. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, no, I grew up in Burton County. I moved down to South Jersey around Atlantic City about six years ago. Met a, uh -huh. met a Jersey girl that went to a New England college and uh, fell in love. Now I'm down here. Uh, yeah, I was, grew up in New Jersey, went to New England college, and then moved to New York. That's, that's hilarious. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man, I'm, I'm not the biggest sports fan, but growing up where I grew up and Brennan grew up in a uh, town nearby. So similar uh, childhood, but everything up there is like Larry Bird or Bobby Orr or Tom Brady. And I come down here and it's like this Philadelphia based teams, there's Washington mm -hmm. teams, New York. It's very different. That was yeah. the hardest. And my experience in life is Jersey's got the best diners and the best pizza. Sorry, sorry, Chicago, New York. It's true. Hey, live with it. So, for those interested, who we got after? <laughs> yeah, live with it. We live got Larry, it. <laughs> we got Larry Barron, uh, the upcoming Monday after this release, followed by Ramsey Campbell and Tim McGregor of the book we talked about, "Heart Strange and Dreadful." 
everybody thank you for listening brennan thank you for being my co-pilot per usual and don thank you so much for giving us a, an hour of your time no well, thanks for having me it was a pleasure to be here absolutely everybody thank you stick around for next time